Hey everyone, it's Lindsay. I am just so excited about today's episode. We are speaking with Pastor Skip Heitzig and it is such a fun and spontaneous interview because for those of you who don't know, we actually record in the studio at Pastor Skip and Linya's church, which is Calvary Albuquerque. And so we just did a very personal Q&A and this interview was the perfect mix between lighthearted and raw and real. For those of you who don't know, Pastor Skip recently had a spinal surgery in two brain surgeries back to back. The brain surgeries were completely unexpected. And he's talking today about his experience with that, where it all started, and how he's healing. He also talks about his marriage with Lenya, why he tried to get out of his proposal, and so much more. We are also addressing coronavirus. And so before we jump into the episode, I just wanted to share a verse that has encouraged my heart during this season. It is 2 Timothy 1.7, and it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. In the face of this virus, in the face of this chaos and empty grocery stores and not knowing where we should be, what we should be doing at all times, I just want to encourage you to pray. Prayer is far more impactful than panic. We cannot control this virus, friends. We cannot control what happens out in the world aside from taking responsibility for ourselves and doing our best to choose compassion and love and to pray. So I want to encourage you to pray for our country, pray for our world, pray for our pastors and the people in leadership who are presenting this to a congregation or to mass groups of people and that they can provide peace and courage and hope to those people. So let us pray and intercede for one another and choose that over the desire to live in anxiety or panic because God is in control of all things and we as Christians should be an example and a voice of reason. Psalm 46, one through three says, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Jesus Christ traveled through towns and villages and cured diseases and illnesses, and we can pray and believe that God will come to our aid and that we will experience healing. And if you are feeling helpless in this season, remember that there are so many opportunities to serve the elderly, to help small businesses, to provide funds for meals for children. There are endless ways to pour out. We all have the opportunity to do so. And I encourage you to take steps forward in any way that you feel called to or that you can. With that said, we are so excited for this interview. If you haven't had a chance to rate and review us and subscribe to our podcast, it would mean so much if you could take 30 seconds to do so. Just scroll down from the main page or from this episode on iTunes, give a star rating and a quick comment review, which encourages us to keep on going and also helps us to get amazing guests like the ones that we've had on the show previously. Thank you so much for all of your support and encouragement along the way. Let's dive in to Pastor Skip Heitzig's interview. Welcome to All The Things, the unscripted podcast where we talk to intriguing people from a variety of cultures, backgrounds, and career paths and deconstruct who they are and why they think the way that they do. We dig deep and ask unexpected questions to learn about all the things, from faith and current events to relationships and mental health. We want to satisfy your craving for knowledge, true connection, and real conversation. This is Lenya Heitzig and Lindsay Maestas. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the All The Things podcast. I'm so excited to announce that we have Skip Heitzig with us today. I have come. (laughs) We've been wanting to have him on, and this was a very spontaneous interview, which is even more fun. I can't tell you how many people have said to me, when are you going to interview Skip? Yeah, It's because they want to know behind the scenes. They want to know the real you. (laughs) People are very voyeuristic. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. They like to to peep into the We do. I think social media is a lot about that, kind of finding Mm -hmm. out what are people doing. Yeah. 
So we're going to do just a QA and a okay. segment, ask you all kinds of fun questions so that people can see so into I'm your So I'm on brain. the hot seat. Yeah. Yeah. So let's... Don't worry, honey. I'm right here. Yeah. Okay, good. Hold my hand if I need <laughs> it. I, I'm here. We'll begin. Okay. Um, number one, what would you tell your 20-year-old self? Yeah, that's a fun question. It's a question I like to ask. I would say to myself... Stay at the task God has given you, mm. um, because I feel, as I look back, I feel no regrets for that. I, but I would say, don't take yourself so seriously. I'd say, learn to relax more. Um, I would say, don't let things become personal, especially in ministry. Um, I would say, try to think ahead a little bit. And of course, you trust God day by day, and you don't worry, but I would say, try uh to just sort of look around the bend a little more. Um, uh, and, and then I, I would probably say, because uh, I've always had fun, but I would say learn to take more time off with your family. Mm. Oh, that's yeah. a really special answer, um, just of all the things that we've been going through recently. Mm -hmm. And Skip has never neglected me, so I don't want people to get that idea. But we both are full-throated, full-hearted, completely in the ministry, in it to win it, uh, actually to win souls for Christ. Mm -hmm. But um, so we both can be workaholics. How's that? Yeah. I kind of typically have one gear, and that's go. Yes. Right? Like those little cars. If go, Skip reverse. Down, if Skip sits down to watch a movie, he falls asleep. <laughs> yeah. That's literally my husband and I. We are on auto drive all the time. But then the second he is down, we, we've never watched a full movie together. And, without and you know what? Popcorn. I don't remember <laughs> names of movies. Ever. I don't know why that is, but it's like when you describe it, oh, yeah, I remember seeing that. But I never remember the name. Is it just not that important to you? Exactly. I guess it's not. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. It's All right. not. I think content, that's my theory. <laughs> content is more important than the sign that you post. Right. I get it. So you mentioned ministry. Are there any decisions at this point in your life now, both Lenya and Skip, um, any decisions that you would change if you could go back about your ministry? Well, um, I don't know that I would. First of all, I believe in God's sovereignty very strongly. So I believe I was led by the Lord. I'd never want to change what God sovereignly brought to pass or allowed. Um, having said that, I, I several times have been naive about people. I usually think the best about them, think they have the best intentions. So I make a decision not knowing that people are still people, fallen people, even redeemed people are still fallen yet redeemed people. Amen. So um, I have been terrifically naive about a number of people on my staff, people I've worked with, people, other colleagues in ministry. So um, would I change things? Probably not, though I might go about them differently. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good question. Um, I was kind of passing through that with Skip, too. For me, uh, my friends tease that I'm a heat-seeking missile. And I, I will tell Skip, do not engage the heat-seeking missile unless you want it to hit the target. So I have like two gears, on or off. I'm either doing it and I'm after it or don't even ask me because if I get engaged, I'm going to have to do it till I kill it. Yeah. And um, so uh, one of my good friends always says that I'm ready, fire, aim. Mm. And so I wish that I would aim a little more accurately or, or slow my pace just a little bit. Um, for me, hitting the goal is more important than getting to the goal. Yeah. <laughs> Although you are a processor up front. That's true. And I'm not. I use, I think it's more, it's more accurate about me that I, I ready, fire, aim. Because I just do it. And then it's like, yeah. oh, man. I kind of <laughs> moved a little fast that on better. that. Like oh, what? Yeah. What is something that you have done that in? Oh, gosh, with me, almost anything. I have a friend that she'll, we, we both want a pair of cowboy boots. Let's just use that. Yeah. And I will buy five pairs and five years later, she'll buy her first pair. Okay. So, I mean, that's just a stupid <laughs> yeah. example. Right. But, um, but that's part of, I, I honestly think that Chuck Smith and the environment in which we were raised was to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life. And sometimes you throw spaghetti against the wall and you go, well, look at that, it's stuck. <laughs> and that's the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And so sometimes it's just that you're giving the spirit room to breathe. And so you're just willing to try things. Mm. And um, yeah. I'm not saying at the risk of being mm. 
stupid, but you're, it's the foolish things of the world that confound the wise. And so sometimes you're willing to try something that, uh, I don't know. I, I You ask what things in particular, I can name a lot of things. Number one, getting married. Mm. I asked Lenny to marry me, and then when she said yes, I said, now wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> I don't know if, you know, let's think this through. And, and and I was the one who initiated the the question. Right. Literally, the conversation, he asked me to marry him. Then I stood up. And um, he, I said, honey, I, or Skip, I probably didn't call him honey then. Skip, I think you just asked me to marry you. And I said, yes. And he literally stood up. He goes, wait a minute. <laughs> I asked you to marry me? And I go, yes. And he goes, I need a drink of water. I have to use the bathroom, and then we got to talk about yeah. this. So, so you see how I process that? Yeah. I like wanted to do it, asked it, and then I said, "Oh, I just asked her to marry me." You know what that means? So That's, it's like you don't even was it? Le- you were led by emotion? No, okay. I was planning to do it all afternoon. Oh, okay. But it finally dawned on me the gravity of that decision. Right. Or when I came to New Mexico, it's like, let's go on an adventure. So we come out here and then you realize, I didn't think through what that means. I have no friends. I have no family. We have no support system. Yeah, we didn't have financial support. We, we both we, got jobs. We don't even, you know, we haven't been here for any length of time. We didn't have anyone to help us bring the furniture in. Right. You had a piano. Oh, wow. And we were carrying everything up the stairs of this apartment. I didn't help with the We piano. didn't have the piano in the oh, apartment. Oh, not then? Okay, well, everything else besides that. I left the piano. Oh, that, that was part of the sacrifice. Oh, no. <laughs> well, anyway, at the end of the night, my knees hurt so bad. I, any, anyway, we yeah. were like yeah. the Beverly Hillbillies in reverse. Yeah. We were leaving Beverly the, Hills. Yeah, they, they left the Hicks and they went to Beverly Hills. We left Beverly Hills and went to a different place, yeah. a different state. But processing that, you know, was very difficult for me. You know, somebody might come out here for a few weeks, think it through, get to know people, develop a network, bring a team, none of that. But I think but that's it worked continually. out and God continued to I, use I it. I tend to already assess those things. In my head, like we're kind of redoing our kitchen right now. For months, I've had Pinterest pages and I would do this and I would do this and I would do this and I would do this. So when I pulled the trigger, I, I did think that through and he tends to be a back end. So we bought this old house by the university and he was in the game the whole way. The first night we spent the night, he goes, we should never have bought this house. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Wait, too late. We've yeah. signed the papers. Yep. What was your very first job? In life? Yeah. I uh, cleaned windows in... Uh, Emil's shoe repair shop. Okay. At a little town in California. So he, it was, I was in junior high. He would let me come in in the afternoons, clean the windows, clean the shop, and minimum wage. And just, uh, uh, but you worked at a gas station. Like well, that was later on. Oh, but okay. the first job was, was cleaning windows. Cleaning windows. What about you, Lenya? Busser, okay. waitress, mm-hmm. cocktail waitress. Mm-hmm. Bartender. Wow. <laughs> How old were you? Oh, I was a bartender because the drinking age in Michigan is 18. Oh. So that I did at the end of high school and college. It still is 18? Was 18. Was? It was then. I don't know. That explains term. a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? What? <laughs> I'm going to let that hang. <laughs> okay. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Um, well, hopefully still here. Uh, hopefully still involved in ministry. Though, as time goes on, you don't, I, I don't foresee myself retiring, but I do see myself restructuring. Okay. And um, yeah, so nothing better than serving the Lord. So in some capacity. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, we, I've spoken to many pastors who just can't envision themselves leaving their church. But they will. All pastors are interim pastors. And we have to think that. And yeah. we have to think we're in transition all the time. And so you do want to plan for it. Um, and, but, and, and I would say you want to kind of map it out, but then you want to have a little bit of flexibility, but I'll say in transition and in planning, you should bring in a group who can see it because now you're transparent. Now you're accountable. Mm. Cause if you just always change the chess players and change your mind, you'll drive everybody nuts. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Um, what is one of the coolest things that you have seen maybe objectively or learned that gave you the most reassurance in God's existence? Um, I always look back since I am a back end processor Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
And I see how infinitely wise God has been to allow even tragedy, uh, even um, accidents, medical things that have happened, just the perfection of God's timing and the people to be there to be involved. Um, so that that's sort of an ongoing display for me. It's like in I see it every day. Mm. But uh, for me, a, a real faith builder was coming out here from California when we were young, newly married, in, in hopes of starting a church. And when it all came together, because I didn't know how to start a church. I talked to my pastor, what do you do? And it was very, his instructions were, were sweet and solid, but very nondescript. Vague. Very Chicuous. vague. Chuck yeah. is a more yeah. God guides, God provides. Right. Yeah. It's like, well, what does that mean exactly? How do I know it's God? How, how is he providing? What can you, can you be more specific? Right. No. And if you have you know? the anointing, <laughs> right. you, you, the people that are you know, anointed, use them. But Chuck really liked Mavericks, and he liked um, nonconformists, and he liked people who what would just— What are Mavericks? You know, somebody who just—the cowboy who'll go out on the plains and go okay. start a settlement, Okay, you know? Yeah. Doesn't really care about the opposition, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so— uh, Kind of a stallion. Yeah. You in, know, a horse that runs wild right. and— He liked to see— um, those who would rise to the top. And if you're going to go out and it fails, okay, great. Now you've got your answer. You shouldn't do this. Mm-hmm. If you go out and it succeeds, then great. You know, let's do it together, right? Yeah. Um, so um, w- when I came out here and saw all that the, and, and continue to see what the Lord does, it was a huge venture of faith. That's what Chuck called it, a venture of faith. And to see God reward those who diligently seek him, it's been amazing. That to me has been the real, you know, from, and I needed that. I remember saying, God, if you want me to be a pastor, you're going to have to prove it to me. Mm. I'm going to have to go out there. I don't want a group. I don't want to get, uh, you know, my advertising in place and a core group raised up and get them to get the vision. I want to go out there and I'm going to start a Bible study. And if you're in it, it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. If you're not in it, I don't even want to do anything. I want nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. So he did it. As Christians, we can look to pastors and we can think, you've got it all together. Your faith is solid as a rock. You don't falter or waver. Have you struggled with the maybe the obligation to study the word and to teach the word? Or has that always been something that's just very fluid and natural for you? Um, but that's a great question. Um, I really love to study. Now, at the beginning, maybe it was more paranoia. Mm. Maybe I was driven by that. You know, I always tell my assistants, I'm a wreck until I give you my outline Outline. on Thursday at noon. Mm -hmm. By Thursday noon, I want an outline. If I don't have an outline, I'm a very, I'm not, you don't want to be around me. Um, Lenya's shaking her head yes. Oh, and I'm the same. I'm not not settled. Yeah, I, I want to know my bearings. Pre message syndrome. <laughs> right. Until you have an outline, you know where you're going. Yeah. It's right. not fun to be around the person who's under that. Right. So I, I because of that, I've and I've always made myself be disciplined. Mm. So I find it comes more naturally for me. I mean, I, I when I was in college, you know, you have to you got to study real hard. When I was studying for medical stuff, it was a rigorous several years. So. Taking that kind of uh, template and taking it into ministry was not a problem for me because it's like, well, if you study this hard in the in the secular field, you should at least study that hard right. spiritually. So I try to give myself about 20 hours per sermon, per, mm-hmm. per message of study uh, for every one hour, 45 minutes of, of Bible teaching in the pulpit. Okay. You mentioned medical struggles. In the past month or so, you've had a spinal surgery and two brain surgeries. Yeah. How has that impacted you emotionally, and how has that impacted your faith? Well, that's a good question. I'm still on on the heels of that. Mm -hmm. Um, Back surgery was elective, meaning I chose to do it. I researched it because I had uh, what what, uh, doctors call an extreme stenosis. When the guy got into my spinal cord, he said, you know, the the diameter of a spinal cord is usually about a nickel. Yeah. Yours was down so tight, you could fit maybe three threads through wow. that opening. So it was like almost, you know, no, it was just almost cut off. Yeah. So I'd been struggling with that for eight years, and I just watched it uh, become degenerative. It progressed. So I was able to look at it, research it, know what I needed, talk to several 
doctors to kind of get a read on it and then select who I wanted to do it and when I wanted to do it. So I was in control. Yeah. And it's fun to be in control. Yeah. And it's fun to have doctors who are really good, who are in control of what they do. And I saw you right before you went and you were excited. You yeah. were thrilled. I was stoked. Yeah. Well, I want to jump in there because you, you're kind of skipping over. I was in pain for eight years. Yeah. So honestly, for eight years, I watched my husband in chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who in our audience has chronic pain, but I dare say a lot. I was just looking at some statistics like, 85.6 million people have cardiovascular issues. 14.5 million Americans are suffering with cancer. 29.1 mm. have diabetes. So more and more Americans have chronic issues or chronic pain. So for Skip, it, it was it was rough. Let's not downplay those nine, eight years. I mean, what was that like? Well, um, most I never said anything publicly about it, but people who were close to me, like every back behind the platform before I go out, they would see my staff would see me stretch and mm -hmm. have to get in certain positions just to make it through. That was for a long time. Well, for that's years. what I was going to say is watching you on the pulpit. I would have never, ever known. Right. So when I announced after the surgery that I had it done, I was like, wow, we never even knew. Mm -hmm. but, but as I was observing you, we would have a grocery cart and you'd put a lot of your weight on it. Or we'd be in an airport with, you know, one of those things for suitcases and almost using it like a walker. Yeah. And um, when he says, I used to have to bend over, he couldn't walk from one end of our house to the other mm -hmm. without bending and touching his toes or lifting your leg up on the counter and trying to stretch. I mean, so this was a long right. period of time. And I mean, bend over, I would have to touch my toes and hold it there. And I remember people saying, wow, you're really limber. That's good. I need to do that. They didn't understand. I had to do that. Mm -hmm. And because it, it unloaded the nerves, it took the pressure off because of that stenosis. So having the surgery, I got to do that electively. That was a success. I'm now able to walk um, what, what would pain you say free. to people who have chronic pain? I mean, what are some things that you experienced in that chronic pain? How did it change you? And, and how did you have such a good attitude? Well, it made me more compassionate. And, and I've always, as a pastor, visited people in the hospitals, prayed for people after mm -hmm. service. Um, but because I'm with people, I never made, when they said, I'm suffering pain, I said, oh man, me too. I, because, and it is about them. I want to make it about them. I want to bring them before God's throne. I don't want to include me and in me, unless it's helpful mm -hmm. to them. And I say, you know what? I've struggled with it. Here's what I found uh, to be helpful. Um, and one of the things I found to be helpful, by the way, was I still stayed active, even though it hurt. So for me to walk the dogs was painful, but it's good to walk, so I did it anyway. Mm -hmm. I rode my bicycle, which actually felt good. And um, once I am able to get back on that again, I'm going to do that with great vigor. Mm -hmm. You're excited about that. I am so excited good about that. Good for you for holding back, though, so that you can fully heal. I know. It's so hard for <laughs> me to know. do that. I don't know who's holding you back. Just kidding. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like that's for. what my job is. Are you sure you should yeah, do yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think. No. But you do good. In your, in your, and now I'm learning to ask you. Yeah. Like um, coming back into the pulpit, this show will have been in advance, but during this week, I was going to come back a little bit early. I said, should I do this date? Should I come back in the midweek or should I wait to the weekend? And you thought about it and said, no, you should wait for the weekend, which I did. And it, it it's helpful. Yeah. So I'm learning to listen to, to listen to people your wife's wisdom. who have yeah. who've observed me closely. Mm -hmm. Also, I think listening to your body. You were really good at just kind of relegating it. You can push yourself through a lot. And, you know, that is, I think, when they statistically look at people with chronic pain, people who have a positive attitude do better than people with a negative attitude. Yeah. People think they're losing a sense of control with the pain, but if you control what you can, you're more successful. So you were still controlling mm -hmm. all the things that you could control and calibrating it to it. And they also say people with chronic pain who have self-esteem or self-worth tend to do better. And so, um, you know, during this time of pain, I'd say we've been closer as a family. Um, and that's part of that self-esteem ability. Humility, um, as you were saying, you sympathize and can um, really be more compassionate mm -hmm. with other people. And just some really good life lessons. Yeah. You, uh, you you know, you see fragility of life. Um, it does humble you because of that. We love control. We try to be in control. We make our own decisions. And we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I mean, God made the human body to withstand an enormous amount. 
He poised us to heal. So as soon as you get cut, got leukocytes mm-hmm. that come to that area, and, and you are poised to heal. But little tiny things can take a life out, like a virus right. can destroy a life mm-hmm. in a few days. Well, I want to talk about coronavirus. But before we get to that, you have both mentioned control. And you had control over your back surgery, but you didn't have control over your brain surgery. Correct. How did that impact you? So they discovered I didn't have a brain, actually. No, I'm just kidding. So <laughs> yeah, right. um, We call him Scarecrow. <laughs> <laughs> so if I only had a brain. Yeah. Uh, with the brain surgery, what it actually was was a subdural hematoma. Mm-hmm. So what that means is blood on the brain between the, the lining of the brain and the skull, which usually comes from acute trauma, blunt force trauma. So when I when I... W- was shown to have this kind of came from out of the blue that uh, the doctor said uh, I came to went to the emergency room because my head hurt and they said oh you you have a a, br- a bleed in your brain mm-hmm. and I said what it was and terrifying it was terrifying mm-hmm. and the only way to fix this is to drill holes and evacuate the blood I'd seen that procedure before in medicine and so I kind of knew what was coming but I didn't because I'd never experienced it right well Honestly, Skip, even though we talked about this chronic back pain, he is a person who's not really experienced a lot of health issues. You've never had a stitch prior to this. You'd never really had surgery. You'd never had a broken bone. And just prior to this brain thing happening, he had said to one of our pastors on staff who suffers from migraines, and I do too, you know, I think I've never even had a headache. Wow. I mean, he's 64 when you get 64. And he had not even had a headache. So one day I came home from Tuesday night women's Bible study. So that was back in January. And he was sitting on the couch, literally moaning. Yeah. uh, Moaning, grimacing, taking, you know, breaths like that. And I said, oh my gosh, what is wrong? He goes, I feel like my head is going to explode. Well, in blunt force trauma, that has to be something big, right? Yeah, it does. And, you know, Lenya, that frying pan that you've chased me around with, <laughs> just got to go. <laughs> so w- what we, because, the, and the doctor said, is there something that you're not telling me? Is- My wife is abusive. <laughs> 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 and so I said, well, doc, I'm tall and tall people notoriously hit their heads on. <laughs> that's their lifestyle, you yeah. know. But, uh, and so I couldn't think of anything. Lenya said, but do you remember the time you came in from the garage You'd hit your head on a bicycle. Now, what that means is I have, have them hanging from the garage, and I walked right into the tube of the bicycle right. at, at full gallop, just bam, and I saw stars. Mm. And uh, it was really hard. And she came in. I came in, and I said, I hit my head so hard, I, I saw stars. Never had that happen before. So that that was like— That get, may have been the may catalyst. Have been, but that's yeah. like getting cocked over the head with a steel pipe. Right. Yeah. And uh, right after that, this is a few weeks before back surgery, right after that, I started experiencing headaches. So I'm on my mountain bike, which I ride every day, rode every day. And even though it's got shocks, every bump was, ow, ow, ow. Mm. It hurt your head. Hurt my head inside. So I knew something was up. Had the back surgery, was recovering. Then I had this severe headache and they had to to evacuate it twice. Yeah. Uh, Well, and and we thought, One of the hypotheses was it could have been related to the back surgery with the spinal fluids. I mean, explain that. Well, and I don't want, listen, I'm not a a physician, so I don't want to But a physician told you this theory. Right. So one of the theories is that it's a combination that uh, A, blunt force trauma, Mm -hmm. bicycle. B, back surgery may have had a nick at the back surgical site down at L, lumbar L4 and L5. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, and even a little bit of cerebrospinal fluid leaks out, you get a decrease in pressure since it's all connected to your brain. Your brain is encased in cerebrospinal fluid at about 30 pounds per square inch. If you take away pressure, the pressure goes down in the brain. If it does, it can pull away that lining Mm -hmm. and cause a bleed. So it could have been- That's so interesting. My husband and I, as soon as we heard about that, we immediately wondered if it had any connection or correlation with the back surgery. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Which is no, no one knows. They can't see inside, so they can't say. But um, for other people who may have a subdural hematoma, 
<laughs> just, I mean, really what we did is he kept having headaches. So I'm like, well, take a Tylenol, take an Advil. Right. And then I was doing hot compresses. We have that buckwheat thing that I can stick in the microwave right. and we were putting that on him. And then we went to our family doctor and he put him on um, antibiotics and a decongestant because we mm. thought maybe it's sinuses. Right. So we were trying things. Yeah. When we finally got to the neuro, neuro the neurologist, room. Um, he said, well, of course, no one thinks they have a subdural hematoma. Mm. They, they would think it would be like a, a sinus infection. So um, some of the symptoms, and Skip had several of those, was pain. Obviously, a really unusual pain, worse than anything he'd ever experienced, and fatigue. Mm-hmm. So what I was noticing at home is he was so tired. You know, he is the ever-ready bunny. I've never caught up with him in my whole life. You know what I mean? I take naps, okay? (laughs) I think naps are a reward. When my husband takes a nap, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so um, during this phase, he was napping, sleeping in, going to bed early, and then the doctor, this is a side humor, so do you mind if we share no. this? He goes, have you noticed any personality change? <laughs> and I didn't know what they meant. So because he had had back issues for the last seven years, irritability is part of chronic pain. I said, well, it's really hard to say because the last few years he's been in so much pain, he has been a little irritable. Yeah. And the guy goes, um, I mean in the last two or three weeks, <laughs> <laughs> not the last two or three three years. So that was a really embarrassing marriage moment. <laughs> that was hilarious. But um, so, but he did have personality change in some of that. Well, when you came back, Lenny, after his first brain surgery, you were like, he's a totally different person. It's almost like, I mean, not manic, but just hyper and back to skip self. Whereas before he was so tired. Well, remember the first night in ICU after the first surgery, how did you feel? I felt like somebody switched on my brain. I felt like mm. everything was in 3D high definition. And I and I got into the uh, my room and I thought, I just knew. I said, I'm not going to get an ounce of sleep tonight. Everything you, just, I'm illuminated. It's like tumbling through my head. Memories are coming. It's it's it, it's a it was a weird feeling. Yeah, yeah. So the first one, and social media never tells the full story, but you guys were keeping people updated on social media. And the first time, it seemed like spirits were relatively high. You were ready to go in and just get it over with, so that you could get your life back to normal. But the second time, maybe seemed more um, like you felt more discouraged. Is that true? I did, but. It's uh, you, you don't want to, you know, you when you communicate and it's positive and then it comes back, you don't want to start communicating until you know yeah. what this is right. and, and what the future is. But and, when it when the second time came around, it was within two weeks of the first one? Three, two, three yeah, weeks. So three fast. Weeks. So it was pretty close on I the I mean, heels. having your brain drilled into and then hearing that you have to do it again mm-hmm. or your, your skull drilled yeah. into and Skip then hearing. It has manhole covers on yeah, when they Yeah, when they do a burr hole surgery, they put titanium plates on it that are affixed by five screws. Why? Because the skull, though it grows back like a bone, it's incredibly slow growth. Mm. So nobody wants divots, you know? So you, you just want a, a titanium plate covers it. And, and and then they sew the skin on top of that. So, so yeah, so it just looks like it's, it's wow. you couldn't tell the difference. And yeah. then the, the plates have like a little spacer in where the tube could go down so it right. could keep draining. So when I went in the second time, I said, so tell me about this. Um, do you have to do two new holes? And he laughed. He goes, no, it's sort of like manhole covers in the street. You just got to lift them up, drain it again, and oh. <laughs> you'll be good to go. But we're going to keep you in the hospital longer. Yeah. But what observe. happened with the second time is it seemed to me that the symptoms were returning and that his fatigue was returning and he was starting to have pain. And kind of for caregivers, I mean, this is part of the lesson is I am trying to be a helper, an advocate, coming alongside of him without irritating him. You don't want to treat him like a child. Mm -hmm. And so I'm constantly saying, on a scale of one to 10, where's your pain? And I'm not trying to demean him. I'm trying to monitor how how worried should I be? Mm -hmm. Because the first time you went to the hospital, they said, we're going to do a surgery right now. And the first um, neurologist sent us home. And that was very disconcerting for me. Because they said, well, you just need to look for a personality change, vertigo, fatigue. And I'm like, well, he has all those those. things Mm -hmm. right now. And I felt like on my watch, like I'm going to know in the middle of the night or how am I going to know it's increasing? And so that was a a lot of weight for me. Yeah. um, That that first go round. And I want to be proactive, but I don't want to overwhelm him either. 
we have a friend that uh, she's going through cancer right now, a really rough bout of it. And her husband, they're really our besties. And he called one day and I said, I don't know what to do, but I feel like he needs to go back. I feel like something's wrong. And he said, you know, I've been studying a lot about we're being caregivers, we're helpers. A helpmate is what it says in scripture. Mm -hmm. And he goes, it's the same terminology of the Holy Spirit, that he's a helper, that he's called alongside of us to help us, an advocate. And he goes, Lenya, you have to be his advocate. You hear things he doesn't hear. You know, you see things in him he can't see, you know, that you really have to be the person who's going to advocate for him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't shrink back. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you're doing that. Thank you. Oh, you make me cry, baby. (laughs) You're really good at it. I, it was hard. (laughs) So the first time I was so afraid that something would happen on my watch or if I made the wrong decision, do surgery and he has an aneurysm, it's my fault. Don't do surgery, he gets a stroke, it's my fault. And so I was nervous about that. And um, the get one of the gals that works in the office, Francesca, she said to me, God has called you to be his helpmate. Mm. And it's like Adam and Eve out of his side, you are the two are one flesh. You will know when it's needed. God's going to give you the confidence and the spirit, and you will have the insight. And I believe you will just feel so confident because you're his helpmate. And that just gave me, it emboldened me Hmm. that I can trust that Skip and I are really one flesh. The two are one. And that any decision I make is for the benefit of him, for bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. So um, anyway, the second time he came home again, I don't know if it was a Tuesday night, maybe it was a... Yeah, I think it was Tuesday night. And um, he, I could just see in his eyes, there there was just this blank-ish look. Yeah. And I felt like I was working hard to get his attention. Hmm. And we had um, company at the house. We were trying to make some decisions. And I, we couldn't get him in the conversation. That's what it felt like. And so we were sitting at the kitchen counter. And in the middle of the conversation, he just got up went over and sat on the couch and fell asleep. Mm. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what do I do with this person that's here? How do I tell them? He actually starts snoring. You need to leave. You were snoring a little bit. (laughs) You should have taped it. I know. Well, fortunately, we know the person. It's not a complete stranger. But um, I just said, since his surgery, he gets tired. You know, I was trying to cover up for it. But then that night is when I was scared. Yeah. And um, you had done a funeral that day. What was I did a funeral, and I have no recollection oh, wow. at all of the event. I don't know who was there. Don't know what songs were sung. Don't know what text I used. Huh. I have no recollection. And so you, have, has anyone said anything about it? Like, were you there? Like, were you I able was to there. speak I clearly? was in the back watching, and it seemed fine. But a couple of the pastors that were sitting with him said he seemed interesting. A little off or disconnected. I don't know what the right words would be. But um, when he woke up from that second surgery, he said, did I do a surgery uh, funeral? A funeral? And I said, yes. And he goes, where did I do it? And I was wow. like, the sanctuary. So scary. So, yeah, it's mm-hmm. really pretty frightening. So Like a concussion. I've had yeah. a concussion as a kid and had I lost. I didn't even know who I was. Mm. So it was so similar. How do you feel now? Now that you're down two surgeries Are well you feeling better? i feel good now but i'm i mean you just you take these things you trust and you mm-hmm. move ahead but you take it just one little step at a time yeah. and you never know well and i think you've heard the lord speaking to you mm-hmm. in the midst of this you know no denying after the first one he was having clarity and insight and and i just have to say now he's so grateful the ho- after every surgery, he was just, I love you. I'm so grateful. I'm so lucky you're here. I'm mm. so blessed. You're the best thing. And um, as he's coming out of the drugs, I can hear him whispering. And I'll say, what are you saying? And he goes, I'm thanking the Lord. Mm. I was thanking the Lord for my staff because they're so amazing. I was thanking the Lord. And so here's someone at their most vulnerable point, right? right. I have another friend that um, daughter had surgery, and she woke up swearing. And I just know when my husband comes up, Mm. he's full of the spirit, Mm -hmm. you know, that he's thankful, he's loving, he's encouraging. And um, so that was, you know, you're seeing the person at their real raw soul. True colors. I can see his soul pretty Mm -hmm. much. There's no veneer, 
you know, when you're that weak and, you know. So that was really amazing, the gratefulness. But then after the second surgery, you were talking about a couple scriptures the Lord was giving you. Yeah, I'm trying to... Re- Jehu or... Oh, right, 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 right. In, in, in um, Chronicles, I think, it says they could tell this guy named Jehu, they could tell it was his chariot because he drove it furiously. Mm. And I thought, that kind of sums up my life. Yeah. I've driven, <laughs> I've driven furiously. I've kind of, you know, I've for years, Both my whole life, I've only taken one day off. I take a Monday off and then I hit it hard. One day off a week. Okay, a not week. once I in his whole life. That in my mind. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry. One day off a week. <laughs> okay. Not one day off, period. Because <laughs> I, like, how, how I have gone like on that? vacations. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, but that, yeah. And I, I justified it by. But an, most of our vacations are you working and we get a day before or after. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so so I moved pretty quickly, and I thought, you know, I'm I'm sort of like Jehu. I've driven my chariot furiously, and then I thought, it's like the Lord said, "Do you want to go fast, or do you want to go far?" Because mm-hmm. that's good. Y- you know, if you go fast, you 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 might hit a speed record, but you won't last. Yeah, and uh, that's true in any organism. It's true in any engine uh, of any vehicle. You have to maintain it, and I'm not great at maintaining. Me, <laughs> so I just determined. You know, I've got that's got to change. I have to be really intentional with the help of others to stay at 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 resting and recuperation to go longer. So the good news is, folks, he's going to take a second day off a week. <laughs> We've been in the ministry almost forty years, and we will now have an actual normal. Um, well, that's what I was going to say. Off. Yeah, that I think this. I mean, the Lord uses all things toward good for those who love Him, and I think this, with the ministry that you both have built and just all that you have poured into other people, that this seems like a time of slowing down and investing even further into your family. Um, your family is so faithful and always so faithful to show up, which speaks so highly of you as a leader of your home. But I just I'm encouraged because I see just fruit, even more fruit coming out of something that was really hard. Well, and you're married to a pastor's kid. Mm -hmm. So you observe how much ministry (laughs) takes. Even if you say, I work six days a week, that doesn't count the overtime, the the phone phone calls. calls. (laughs) They said at the same time, the hospital visitations. And we love it all. That's Mm -hmm. not complaining. I don't ever want to complain that God has called us to the ministry. But it it does have a certain demand. I love it. Listen, we're on the church campus right now. I love being here. Yeah, I love it. It's hard for me to, to leave it. Yeah, it's true. But it can be unhealthy. Mm-hmm. So I'm reading Psalm 23 a little differently these days. David said, he makes me lie down. Yes. So the Lord just made me lie down. That's encouraging to me. My spirit is very similar to yours. And so that's it's encouraging to me. So speaking of people who are go, 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 um, and a little transitioning a little bit here, the coronavirus is a thing right now. And there are some people who are saying, forget it. I'm living my life. If I die, I die. <laughs> cheap airfares right yeah, now. Yeah, cheap airfare. I'm, I'm going to fly. <laughs> and then there are people who are stocking up and scavenging a mm-hmm. little bit and panicking. What would you speak maybe <laughs> to the indifferent and to the chaotic? How would you speak to that? I'd hearts? say you both need to you both need to meet in the middle. Mm-hmm. Uh, you both need a little balance. You can't be cavalier with this because sure, you're going to live your life, but to live your life, to say, I'm going to do what I want to do and, you know, live my life and I'm, you know, is a selfish attitude because you can be a carrier to mm-hmm. people who are more vulnerable. So you may not be affected by it. You may not even get it. It might not really, you might carry it, but not really get severely affected by it. And a cure for you would be a quick cure. But somebody who's older has respiratory cardiac problems, it could kill them. It's choosing love over your freedom. Yeah, good. yeah, that's, yeah that's good. good. Yeah. Bam. Exactly <laughs> right. At yeah. the same time, you don't want to be foolish. I mean, we're not stockpiled. I'm a, a good old Midwest girl, and my grandma had a pantry. We've talked about this mm-hmm. on the um, kitchen dinner table. table. Dinner yeah. table. And my mom has a pantry. I have a pantry. We, I was with some girlfriends a couple of weeks ago. And I said, so if you had to self-quarantine, could you live? And I was like, oh, yeah, I had two, two weeks easy. I've got stuff in the freezer. Plus, I love to cook. My pantry stocked. And they looked at me aghast, like, oh, my gosh, I go shopping every other day. Mm -hmm. Mm. And I said, no, when I go, I stock up. (laughs) At any given time, if the grandchildren show up, they could name like three or four recipes and I could whoop it up. Yeah. 
So I already have a pantry that is stocked. And I'm kind of the same thing with toilet paper. <laughs> we have um, a couple of bathrooms and they are pretty full. I, I guess I just don't ever want to run out of toilet paper. Yeah. But I mean, there's some prudent things you should mm-hmm. do, but you don't need to go crazy. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's- I think I think the awareness my husband has been saying, the awareness is that there will be people who who react in that way. They react with chaos a little bit. And so we have to be aware of how they're reacting, but also just choosing to do things more wisely. Lenya and I just saw that Disney is closing down. And so it's considering other people above ourselves that yes, maybe we won't get sick because if we're younger, there are countries that are closing down. And it's important for us to, again, just go back to love one another above ourselves and just being aware of what's happening, but being wise and discerning at the same time. Yeah. And what we have to realize is that at at the date of this taping, there's not adequate testing available. Right. So we say this person, we, there's two more cases through. There's a, probably a lot of people. Yes. One doctor that I saw, ep- epidemiologist nationally known, said he believes between 40 and 70% of the public are affected by this wow. or carriers of it. Mm-hmm. It's that high. But because we don't know, we don't know. Yes. And so we kind of have to catch up and get tested and get a vaccine for it. Well, and you don't want to test if you don't need it. You know what I mean? Because there are other people who really do need it. Again, it's that selfless thing. So it's kind of, have you been exposed? Have you been traveling to one of those countries? Or have you traveled? If you've gone to an airport, let's say you connected in New York City, a lot of people they have discovered have gotten it. Well, and I think there's a lot of people also that are blaming the media for hyping it up and making it something that it is not But yet I have seen a lot of personal individual messages from people. There was one woman in Italy who was saying, I understand that everyone, that people are minimizing the Mm. severity of this because they don't fully understand it. But we in Italy are on lockdown right now. And all we're trying to do is manage the cases. And the problem isn't so much that these young people or older people have it. It's that our healthcare system cannot keep up with it. And that is what we in America are trying to prevent is the inability to keep up with the needs of the patients. Because in Italy, um, she said that in her newspaper, one of the officials said, at this point, we're having to decide who's going to live and who's going to die based on how old they are. And that is, I mean, it's terrifying. And this is not media. This is one person's very personal experience with this situation. And again, not to fear monger, because if it's controlled and if we are wise about this, it's going to be okay. But we're trying to flatten the curve so that mm-hmm. it's not all of these people. We're buying time is what we're doing. So, right. so every precaution, you know, washing your hands, not shaking hands, not hugging, just kind of saying hello. Sneeze in your sleeves, leave right. it a Kleenex, yeah. throw it away. Using de- all that stuff, washing your hands. I'm doing elbow bumps. Right. <laughs> all that does, all that does is buy us time until we get something in place. But this is not without precedent. Martin Luther faced a plague in Europe mm. where millions of people were dying. And yet he called for Christian compassion during that time, but also a very wise as serpent, harmless as dove. Yes. Don't get in and try to get infected, but see this as an opportunity because if if all of your life is this side of heaven and not that side of heaven, you, you know, you're going to live uh, as a hermit. Mm-hmm. So the balance of being out, ministering to people, but being safe. Good. I want to add, Christians in the Roman era, when the church was early, the plague came and everybody ran and the Christians stayed and cared for those who mm-hmm. had the plague. So look, I know, and going back to illness, I've had cancer yeah. and I'm going to die. You know, someday it could have been cancer 10 years ago. I didn't, but I know where I'm going. Mm-hmm. I know that I have eternity. And so I'm going to look at this world a whole lot. I'm passing through. This is temporary. And uh, so I would much rather give my life. It's why I do things like Reload Love. I'm not afraid to go to a terror-stricken nation because I just trust Jesus. I'm not stupid, but I also understand that it's kind of like Dave Eubank said, we live in these earthen vessels, Mm -hmm. but um, we're meant to let the treasure that's in them come out. And if we go home and just cover up our vessels and move into monasteries and, you know, we're only with people that, I don't want to be Howard Hughes, you know, that. (laughs) Yeah. So um, I just would encourage Christians, don't lose your compassion during all of this and, you know, make yourselves available that you can be a part of the solution. That's good. Thanks. 
Um, okay. Well, another question that I have. You have been married, Lenny and I discovered 39 years. Wow. That is we have? incredible. Yeah. So, what do you think of that, Lenny? <laughs> I think it's the best 39 years of my life. Wow. <laughs> what would be your marriage advice? And I don't want to just be cliche with this of what would you say? But I, I mean, you have been, again, through brain surgery, spinal surgery. Lenny's been through cancer, depression, and battle through those things. What would be your encouragement to couples that marriage just isn't always fun and games? It, it isn't always easy. Um, I, I would say, gosh, there's a lot of things I could say. Yeah. First of all, I, I would sit around and say, now, you realize that it's not all fun and games. You realize that from the beginning, right? Better I mean, this isn't worse. new news to you, yeah. I hope. Yeah. I hope yeah. you're not that naive as to think it's we we'll put a white picket fence and live happily ever after. When I'm going to, when I asked Lindy to marry me and then I realized she said yes and I stood up and I said, now wait a minute. What I was dealing with is, and I, I did, I, I struggle with it, not just that night, but all the way up to my wedding. Mm. Even the day of my wedding, I struggled with it. It was, it was fearful because I knew I was making a commitment that would last my lifetime. I knew that divorce would never be an option. We would never discuss it. I knew it. That's yeah. how I was raised. That's what I knew to be true from scripture. So I'm walking into this going, this is a big choice. So it's good to have that going in. It's good to remind yourselves of that while you're in it. It's good to agree that you will never, even in the heat of the moment, bring up the D word, divorce word, yes. ever. It's it's banned from your vocabulary. And then set up rules for engagement, like in any battle. Mm -hmm. So we had rules whenever we get in fights that we would pause, go to our corners, go to a public place, not a private place, and discuss it. Why public? Let's say you're in a restaurant. You're not going to yell at each other in a restaurant mm -hmm. unless you're insane, mm -hmm. right? So most people, because they're in a in an environment where there's people around but not listening. And in a restaurant, Skip can't start crying and, and the whole <laughs> thing. <laughs> and I you like can't that. take that frying pan out. <laughs> that's really, that's really, I've never heard that before to ha have that kind of disagreement in a public place. That's another, good. another is to have an item like this little water bottle or a ball and say, whoever holds the ball, it's their turn. Nobody can interrupt them. Mm. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you w the issue that I have with you, Lenya. Then I give it to you and I say not a word and, and she starts talking. Good. So if you have little rules built in, you can manage through difficult Fighting times. Fighting fair. Yeah. yeah. How to have a good fight. Yeah. <laughs> and would you say thinking the best of one another is important? Yeah. It, that takes time. I mean, yeah. you have to really understand each other. And to be uh, truthful, I, I knew Lenya, but I really didn't know her until we get married. I don't think anybody really right. does. Until you're living with someone and oh, you yeah. see the ins right. and outs and the quirks. And I'm not big on long dating. I never thought that was a good idea mm -hmm. because there's just too many things you'll find out to make you want to turn back. Right. I think you become mature, you make the decision, and you jump in, but you jump in with the kind of support system needed and those kind of tools needed to work your way through it. Good. I heard someone say that love is willing the best for the other person. Mm. So if I love Skip, I want what's best for him in all circumstances and vice versa. He wants what's best for me. Mm -hmm. And so when, when he was a little flaky during that period, <laughs> <laughs> sure, he jumped up when he asked me to marry him, but after the invitations were out, he came and he said, I don't think I want to get married. Yeah. <laughs> oh, after you sent yeah. your actual invitation? When I invitations? said I struggled with it, I meant it. <laughs> He's oh, not kidding. Wow. So he came over and he goes, I don't know, shifting sands, stoplights, and whatever. He had these analogies. <laughs> Metaphor. And so he said, I don't know that we should do this. So he left, and I told my parents. My dad said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and But what I told him is, I love you enough to let you go. If I'm let me, not, let me, let me tell you exactly go. what you said. You said, I love you so much. And I'm going, oh, here you go. I love you so much. I can't let you go. He said, I love you so much that if I'm not God's best and highest for you, I don't want to marry you. Wow. And that's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> I went, wow. <laughs> and then I thought that after that night, I thought, you are such that an idiot it. skip. Right. Yeah. So I called you up. We met for lunch that day over by your dad's office and yep. talked that through and green light was on again <laughs> i know i was so sick to my did stomach. you feel did you struggle feeling like rejected um i was honestly walking in the fear of the lord mm. i was really fearful that again i believed 
it was for a lifetime. And I had had not good examples. There's divorce all over my family. I didn't want to experience that. And I really did want what was best. And I wanted God's will above all else. Mm -hmm. And so I was just seeking God, show me your will. And I was praying. This is literally what I was praying for him at that time. In a proverb, it says, the king's heart is in the hand like a course of water. Yeah, like in the hand of the Lord. Like the water courses, he turns it whichever way he wishes. And so that's what I told the Lord. Skip's heart is in your hand. Hmm. And you can turn his heart wherever you want. And if that's where you want this to be, then turn his heart. If you don't, then I can accept from your will that that's not what you have for me. And so just always trying to surrender your will to his will. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's the one of the biggest battles in marriage is surrendering your will to his will because yes. divorce comes because of the hardness of heart. Mm-hmm. Hard hearts <laughs> cause divorce. But when you're mm-hmm. trying to have your will be God's will, then there's not really an issue. Yeah. And when we both want God's will for each other and for our marriage, then... Um, it's just such a unifying thing. Mm. How can Did, two walk together unless they agree? Yeah, that's so good. Thank you guys for sharing that. Do you, I think counseling tends to be stigmatized. Have you guys ever pursued marriage counseling or do you promote marriage counseling as something that's healthy for couples? Both. When we were uh, young in our marriage, mm-hmm. um, we had a, a, a somebody who became a real trusted friend, an older gentleman who was a skilled, godly Dwight. counselor. Mm. And... Gave, just gave us direction and had insight um, because of his we experience into tests, our character. as I remember, because I was having a tough time. And so he had us do this test. Uh, it was one of those personality tests. I don't know, Myers-Briggs, somebody. And he had us both do the test as ourselves. And then they had us do the test as we would project how Skip would answer it or how I would answer it. And what we learned is I projected that Skip was my dad. I thought I'd married my dad. And Skip and my dad have similarities, and they're both great men, but he is nothing like my dad. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of my mix-up was projecting. The, the man I thought I married, I was treating him not like the man he was. And I needed to be able to separate you know, who Skip really was for who I thought he was. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes we role-play with people. And it's like, you don't even know me. That's, you know, Mm. so um, that's what we discovered when we first, do you remember that? Yeah, I do remember that. that And um, so, yes, we highly recommend it. You know, every car needs tuning. Every marriage needs tuning. It's prevented. I, we're such big advocates of it because it's prevented. It doesn't, you don't have to wait until the disaster to get help. You shouldn't wait until the disaster to get help. Do it beforehand preventative have conversations and it opens up doors of communication and like you're saying Lenny it allows you to see maybe just a different perspective into someone's soul and heart that you wouldn't see because you're a little bit blinded by your own right. perception it's a it's an objective third party yeah. so with with Dwight uh, what he would do is he would listen to us and then he'd stop because skip when you say this this is what she hears mm-hmm. And I go, well, that's not what I meant. That's not my it. My point is that is what she hears. That is what you are producing when you say that word or that tone. Mm -hmm. So he would instruct me how to say it differently in a different manner. And it was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question. What is your favorite part about being a dad? Like what is the most honorable or just what's your favorite part? Well, the, the, the best part to me, there are two things. First thing I, I noticed when Nate was born is it made me appreciate the sacrifice of my own parents. So it made me grateful, very thankful, yeah. because I didn't really, you know, I kind of undercut my own parents. I loved them, but I didn't give them the respect that was due. And when I had my son, it shifted that focus. And I remember one of the first things I did was call my mom and dad and say, I'm sorry, yeah. and thank you. <laughs> yeah. and, and then number two, it really gives me insight into the character of God. Um because it's uniquely with me, I have an only begotten son. Mm-hmm. So when I when I put him in my place, like I did on a tour to Israel, uh, I couldn't go, and I had brought about three hundred people to go to Israel. I couldn't go, but I sent my son, yeah. who represented not only me but his heavenly Father well. So um, I like that, and and you know we'd love to have had a lot of children, right? But God gave us one, mm-hmm. and and. Um, you know, you remember that scripture where uh, her husband says, am I not better to you than 10 sons? You know, my son is better to me than 10 kids. Mm-hmm. He's just so 
good. And, and, and one is what the Lord knew I could manage. And it wasn't just about me training him, because I did train him, and I did let him know that I'm your dad, but you have a dad in heaven, and one day I will not be in this role. I'm really here just to graduate you into that role with him. Mm -hmm. But he taught me a lot about God. My son taught me a lot about God. So I love that. I love how the Lord uses people to teach you about life. They're very tender-hearted toward father-son. If there's a movie that's father-son, they'll cry. And I do have to say in this illness, um, if there's an upside, is just the connectedness that those two had and just being able to freely cry or share their love, share their emotion, shoulder the burden. It, it was just a really beautiful thing mm-hmm. um, to observe. I'd never had a great relationship with my dad. Mm. He was a strong man. He was an authoritative man, but he wasn't a warm and winsome man. And that changed a little bit, but it didn't change with his initiative. Um, When my brother died in a motorcycle accident, and my dad was very harsh with me the night of my brother's funeral. Um, And he even stood up and said to me in front of the whole family, you are going to hell. Why? Why? Because he wasn't Catholic, because I wasn't Catholic anymore, and he was dealing with a Catholic funeral. He was dealing with guilt from my brother's death. The only way he knew how to deal with it is lash out at me because he's a skip is somehow different than everybody else in my family. Mm. So the Lord's, you know, it was such a shock. You know, that that puts a damp on the whole room. But the Lord said to me. If things are going to change, it has to start with you. And I'm thinking, why me? He's he's the authority figure. says, because you're redeemed. Yeah. That's why. And if he's going to see love, it's got to come from you. So I walked right up to my dad after he said that I hugged him, mm. held his held his head next to my, so his ear was next to my my voice, my, my uh, mouth. And I started praying out loud. Mm. And I prayed for him and I prayed for us. And I said, in Jesus' name, amen. And I let him go and he was stunned. And he looked at me and goes, that was beautiful. Wow. So I just determined every time I see him, because he never said, Skip, how are you? I love you. He never did that. I just said, every time I see my dad when I leave, I'm going to say, I love you. Mm-hmm. And I did, and he acknowledged it or said thank you. But there came a day. I said, Dad, I love you. And he said, I love you too. Wow. So that was the payoff. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> a weepy. <laughs> I know. Um, in what ways... Did that impact you, the not getting in, I'm proud of you, or I guess having that aggression, did you have to work through that as a dad, or did you feel like God just broke that cycle in you? Well, um, I'll tell you, it had a negative effect, not getting approved. It always does. Mm -hmm. Hear that, dads, if you're listening, or moms, kids need to know they're special, and you need to to show that and say that. Um, But with me, what it did— Around junior high, it distanced me so much from my dad that I came to a place where I didn't care what he thought. So I'll tell you why that's, we know that's bad Mm -hmm. because I should care and I should get that affirmation, but it kind of strangely distanced me from needing approval of others that if if I'm going to get approval, it's because I did what was right and I know I did what was right. Mm -hmm. I have to kind of come to to my own moral compass. So as a believer redeemed, not only did I need to say, I love you to my dad and restore that relationship. But it was helpful for me to know, you know, if if I do something, people may or may not like it, but that doesn't really matter much to me anymore. I don't have to, I don't live for their approval yeah. because I've kind of been trained that way. But, but there's a perfect heavenly father. His approval matters more because mm-hmm. now I've been reschooled and reset uh, and, and reoriented. So, um, under that, Josh McDowell always used to say, rules without relationship equals rebellion. And I was rebellious. So if his dad only has rules and no relationship, Skip was a rebellious guy. And so I just, in, in any parenting, you have to have relationship in with the rules or you are a breeding gar- ground for rebellion. Yeah, apart from Christ, I was I was doomed. I, my One of my good friends, Gino, at the time, every time we see each other, we go, we're still amazed we're not dead because mm. we should have died by about age Does 16. Does he work on cars? <laughs> no, he doesn't. Okay. I know as you know, works on cars. <laughs> no, he's, he's a pastor. Oh, okay. But in, uh, in up in Denver, oh, but, okay. But um, I, you know, I, I live a rebellious life. I was in jail at age sixteen. Mm, I didn't know that. Yeah. For what? Grand <laughs> theft. 
Um, really? And breaking and what entering. What are going to do when they come <laughs> for you? <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to use that as an example because I think so often we can come to a place where we say my circumstances are bad. Therefore, I'm going to live in that and I'm going to continue living my life based on my circumstances. My dad didn't treat me this way. Therefore, this is how I act toward my family. But this is just proof that Jesus truly can restore your relationship with Nate. Your solid marriage is an example of his redemption and that the cycle can be broken, but it takes an active will and a faith. It does. Exactly. Well said. Again, bam. (laughs) Thank you. All right. We'll go a little more lighthearted. Just a couple more questions. What's your favorite food? It varies. What is my favorite food, Lenya? Do you know? Uh, He will always say salad with fish on it. Yeah, I oh. do love. I, I I do eat clean. You I, love olives. I love Mediterranean food. Yes. How's that? Okay. You like roasted garlic. <clears throat> yeah, all that Mediterranean Spicy. stuff. I love it. Hummus. You love like red chili and Tabasco. Jalapenos. And yeah, it's got to have sriracha some spice. And... What is your favorite book of the Bible? Do you have one? Oh wow! You know, I wrote the Bible from thirty thousand feet, and I struggle with that question all the way through because mm. whenever I go through a book at that time, that becomes my favorite book. Yeah. And then I'm on to the next one. Um, so, yeah. Really try. Okay. <laughs> I'll hear. I'll say this. The Gospel of Matthew. Okay. Why? Because it was the first book I read as a new believer. Usually we tell people, read the Gospel of John. Nobody told me that. So I had a New Testament. First book in it was Matthew. And I remember, and here's why it really is my favorite. It was in a modern translation. But... I was a believer. I truly believed in Jesus. I loved him. I knew I was saved. But nobody told me that doing drugs was sinful. I didn't have a moral conscience that said that. Mm, Same. So so I was witnessing to my brother, you need to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. But I said, Bob, you can smoke pot. You can do whatever you want. You -hmm. you can take any of that. That's not going to change. But you have to repent of your sins. Well, here I am sinning, telling him to repent of his sins, not seeing that as sinful, but feeling a little uneasy. So I'm reading Gospel of Matthew. I'm in the Sermon on the Mount, and this translation happened to put it this way. I think it was called Good News for Modern Man. Blessed is he whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. Mm. And that floored me. I closed the book and I thought, I'm not doing that. My greatest desire is is not to do what God requires. My greatest desire is to do what I want. Yeah. So I thought, I think I need to flush that pot down the toilet because I think that's impeding me. Again, I didn't have a great moral compass. So I did it, and so I, I, I saw that by applying Scripture immediately to my life, my life could change. Mm-hmm. I could take on different patterns and habits. So that's my favorite. Now yeah. it's important. My favorite is James, and it's mm-hmm. similar reason. First, not book that I read, but first book that made me weep. Hmm. I read the book of James and it just slayed me. And I remember thinking how profound it was and how much I related, resonated, wanted it in my life. And um, so it's still kind of got a sweet spot for me. Mm -hmm. And it's so practical, which is so much like you. That is me. (laughs) Oh, okay, great. It's so interesting because it's talking with you. You have no idea. And I, I I can't imagine as a pastor and a pastor's wife, the impacts that you have on people around the world. So I want to tell you a couple of my stories before I close out. So speaking of pot, I was a pothead when I was 14. I had this boyfriend and it was such a bizarre relationship, but we would drink and we would smoke and then we read the Bible together. And that's like, that was our thing. We loved reading Revelations because it freaked us out and it convicted us. But then we would still be smoking, but we justified it. And that was like Mm. his vice. It Mm. wasn't so much mine. And we couldn't find anything in the Bible that said, don't specifically smoke pot. So we justified. We came to church. That was one of the first times not with my parents that I came to church um, with him. And you spoke specifically on that topic. Which is so rare. Yeah. And being sober minded. And that was one of the things that stopped me. From doing that. So then a couple (sighs) years later, I come to church and Josh McDowell was teaching. Mm -hmm. And this is such an incredible thing. I still wasn't a believer. He turned around and there were people in line to talk with him. And he turned around and he said, I just, I feel like the Lord's telling me that you need to write and you need to study journalism or English. Oh my goodness. Yes. And so my mom's crying. Yeah. My mom's crying. And she says, what is that? 
the coincidence of that, what is that coincidence? And I was like, oh, it's just, he's just, you probably talked to him (laughs) before and said, no, that is the Lord speaking to you. And just to be here right now makes me emotional um, because that was just beautiful. And then another time I came, well, it was ultimately the time I was saved and I had just been pulled on my heart. I would bring my family to church and we would listen and then we'd go and just sin but we kept coming and we felt so encouraged by your teachings that you were so faithful to read the word of God because we wouldn't really open a Bible on our own mm. um, at that point. And I surrendered my life in mm. the second row at um, wow. Calvary. And after that, I came up to you and this just reminds me of um, what you were saying about when people say they're sick, you don't want to put it back on you. I was feeding the homeless and we were doing all kinds of things. And I came up to tell you that every single one of those homeless men that I spoke with said, Skip Heitzig, I continue listening to him. I mess up my life. I fall short, but I always go back to listen to Skip. And he's changed my life. And it was person after person after person. So I went up to the stage and I said, I just have to tell Skip. And it was like you, I don't, it just went right off of you. And immediately you just said, good for you for doing that. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not talking about myself. (laughs) I'm telling you how you're impacting. But it was just such a humble heart that you immediately put it back on what I was doing and not the massive work. And then last story, I was in Germany on a train going from Germany to Germany to Amsterdam, um, I think. And I heard your voice and I went, (laughs) we walked up because I was a believer at the time, walked up to the conductor and he was listening to you. And I said, oh my God. That's, no way. that's the pastor at my church. And he said, um, I listened to him. Any chance I can listen to him. I put him on the train in Germany, even though a lot of people don't understand English, so that they can hear the word of God. He's changed my life. Wow. Thank Isn't that you, crazy? Lord. I've never heard that. That's <laughs> yeah. so encouraging. Yeah. So Thank it's you, just, Lindsay. Of course. I just want to encourage both of you, um, especially in a trial season, of the impact that you make around the world. I mean, it's just, it's a really, really cool thing. And mm. then just in very individual lives as well. Mm, that's so, beautiful. Yeah. So thanks for being on with us. Thanks for being vulnerable and sharing your life. I, I thank you for having me. Sure. And um, I listened to this podcast. I've listened to several of them with the different guests you have. So good and such variety mm. and so insightful. So yeah. good job, guys. It's been a lot of fun. It we has really been. enjoyed it. Thank right. you, Lindsay. Thanks, Skip. Oh, thank you. For behind the scenes videos and photos, as well as info about our upcoming guests, follow along with us on Instagram at all the things.podcast. You can keep up with Lenya at, at Lenya Heitzig and Lindsay at, at Lindsay.myestis. If you'd like to listen to past episodes or learn more about us, visit the all the things podcast.com.